Welcome to Lecture 7A. This is uh, Tom Stevenson, and this is Human Resources Management. And in this lecture, we're going to look at some very interesting topics, high commitment organizations and Deming's 14 points of total quality management. For those of you in the quality management area, you, you'll find this of interest, and I'm sure you'll have a lot to add to the synchronous class when we discuss uh, this topic there. So uh, I just wanted to wrap up a little bit on governing acts for Ontario. We kind of finished the last uh, lecture and we were discussing uh, Ministry of Labor and Labor Relations and a little bit of those topics. Um, there is the, uh, when we talked about unions, the Labor Relations Act of 1995. That's what governs the, the act and uh, regulations for Ontario. Uh, you can look this up online. If I posted the slides, you should be able to just click on that, I think, if you're in PowerPoint mode. Uh, otherwise, you can just Google Labor Relations Act uh, 1995, and it should come up. It says 1995. It's not that it hasn't been updated since 1995. That's when the original act was put into uh, place. There's been numerous updates to it uh, on an ongoing basis. And uh, we also have uh, the Employment Standards Act, and that's kind of like where uh, employers in Ontario, what they need to follow. So the Employment Standards Act has things like minimum pay, minimum wage uh, effects, uh, hours of work, uh, those kind of things. So it's actually a pretty good site to uh, get up to speed on that. It's usually with the acronym EAST. ESA for Employment Standards Act and uh, this is the governing, governing act for employers to follow. Uh, all kinds of information there depending on what sector you're in and uh, what regulatory requirements you need to meet. So take a look at that when you get a chance as well. Um, today as I mentioned we're going to look at high commitment uh, human resource management and what that is, and some of the aspects of what it takes to be a high commitment organization under that definition. So uh, it's that the firm really seeks three dimensions of employee effort to satisfy high commitment. So uh, what a company wants is for its employees to work for the best interests of the organization and understand what those interests are. So clarity, transparency, uh, that employees will know exactly what they uh, need to do and where the business is going. And we, this evolves and works back to what we talked about in the first class, which was uh, when we talked about vision, mission, values. There's a lot of clarity of that in a high commitment organization. Uh, employees are flexible, willing to take on assignments different from their day-to-day -day work. None of this, this is not in my job description, this is not my job sort of, sort of, uh, talking, a high commitment organization is you get excited when you get to expand your circle of competence, so to speak. So that can be really exciting for people that way. Uh, so that's what those companies will be encouraging. It fits in well with, be, with change and innovation that's going on right now, right? So that's kind of a, a good match there. Employees are given more freedom in decision-making processes. Thus, they can use their judgment in a number of situations. Employees are encouraged to think in a continuous improvement manner. So kind of getting back to what we'll be talking about later with the total quality management, continuous improvement. Uh, high commitment organization fosters the condition where that's so. So again, historically, we looked at Taylorism and Fordism and not a lot of freedom in the decision-making process. Kind of thou shalt do it this way and you're micromanaged and you're watched. Uh, so a high commitment organization is trying to shed that kind of philosophy and open it up to more creativity, more innovation, and more purposeful work, uh, which can be a win-win for both the company and the employees. The struggle is, as we said, with systems and with uh, goals is to try to get the right combination so we can have systems in place that allows the organization to really put things in motion uh, and goals, all of the varieties of goals that we were discussing earlier, but also have that innovation side uh, where employees have some latitude in the decision making. What that latitude is, there's no hardline definition, 
there's always some uh, boundaries, but definitely not such tight boundaries that employees just, I'm just going to do my job. It's three o'clock. I got another hour. No, that would not be a high commitment organization. So uh, some of the aspects of a high commitment uh, mode, uh, organization, the motivators, the cultural aspects, well, employment guarantees in the sense that as much as possible, right? And I, I don't believe today in today's environment, there's any kind of employment guarantees, but definitely a high commitment organization is not having a big turnaround of people. You know, unless there's some big external force, like we talked about in one of the earlier classes, that drives that organization to have to shed workers, um, they're doing everything in their power not to have a high turnover. Uh, it's more towards the happy family than the dog eat dog, so egalitarianism. Hard to have people working collaboratively in teams if you're a dog eat dog kind of environment. So egalitarianism, more on equality of how you work with your peers. Emphasis on the self-management team and team production. So if it doesn't require a team, uh, it, then it doesn't necess necessarily dictate that you need to have the high commitment organization style. Uh, job enlargement and enrichment. And that means the opportunity to do more, to be more, to expand what you're able to do, uh, and intrinsic motivations, right? So intrinsic motivations. And you're seeing how all these little things that we've been talking about in the other classes, they're starting to form a network of little tools and things that companies look at uh, when they're trying to formulate uh, the organizational strategy, how the culture is going to be, and goals, decisions, and monitoring. Premium compensation, including efficiency wages, they want to attract the best. Back to Jim Collins, uh, we want to get the right people on the bus, so they, they pay well because uh, high commitment organizations usually do well. When you do well, you can usually pay well. Incentive compensation based on team instead of individual. So it's not that there's no meritocracy. It's just that it's more based on team or the unit and the firm or combination of all three. Uh, so job rotations. Well, if it's something that people do over and over again, they also want to have them have a better understanding of the big picture so you can rotate to different positions to get a better understanding of what other people do. Uh, a lot of banks uh, that uh, sort of operate in this sort of process will have opportunities for workers to even go to different countries. If you're on a fast track that you want to move up the ladder, uh, they may have that, well, you have to to get to be ahead in your own country, you have to work in another country prior to. So that's, but then they offer the opportunity to go there for a year and it's almost like a sabbatical to learn the ropes of how the organization works in another country. And then you can take some of those ideas back uh, when you move up. And you'll also have more wider networks. And rotations can be very simple too. It doesn't have to be to another country. It can be just in different positions so that you have a good understanding. Some companies will, when they first hire people, have them work two months in this place, 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 before they settle into their core job. Just so, again, you've got contacts, you've got a breadth of understanding how things uh, work within the organization. <clears throat> Transparency, open information. Well, if you want high commitment from people, you can't be hiding stuff. So if managers are only get feeding information as they see fit and they're hiding stuff, you're not going to have a high commitment organization. So you want to have open channels of communications, flattened hierarchies, people are accessible, uh, not the sort of hard line reporting sequence that you see in traditional uh, companies. So a lot of culture in that egalitarian teamwork. So we work collaboratively, we work together. We're not at each other's throat and at throats and adversarial. Uh, extensive screen, uh, screening for cultural fit when you're hiring, trying to make sure you've got somebody that fits well with teams and groups and that sort of thing. And we all know there's some people, groups aren't their thing. Uh, and it takes some time and effort for them to fit in in this type of organization. Uh, strong emphasis on ownership, taking responsibility, being accountable to others. 
uh, for your work. So that's important as well in a high commitment organization. So the goal is a, a dedicated, flexible workforce that works with their hands as well as their heads. And I always uh, think of Jack Welch. I think I may have mentioned this in a previous lecture where he was working with, uh, when he first got uh, promoted as CEO, he went around the front lines, management by wandering around a, uh, a very important uh, process that was developed by Hewlett Packard. Packard, management by wandering around, MBWA. Uh, very, very effective tool to use uh, because you get to communicate with people firsthand that are actually doing the work. People that are in the trenches, you get to communicate with them and you get to ask them questions. And in a case like a manufacturing plant, that communication process is crucial because very often the people that are working with their hands know how to resolve some of the small issues that are occurring uh, on the front lines. And so Jack Welsh mentioned that uh, when he was walking the lines the first time after becoming CEO, one of the workers came up to him and said, Jack, you had us working with our hands. You asked me to work 25 years ago. I've been working with my hands for 25 years. You never once asked me what I thought, right? And he took that in. He thought, wow, what a, what a lost opportunity if we've been doing that with a lot of our employees. So the goal of high commitment is to get a dedicated, flexible workforce that works with both their heads and their hands from that perspective when you're talking about frontline workers. And if you're a manager and you've got people on the front lines, then it's good to be asking those questions and trying to dig in deep to those processes. So to reach that goal, employees need to be recruited who are capable and have a predisposition to put out the effort necessary uh, employees uh, must be developed and trained. They must be enabled by giving them authority and mechanisms must be in place to motivate them to put in the effort to achieve the high expectations set before them. So there's a number of factors that play into that, but this is the overarching goal of high commitment organizations, which sounds pretty good. Recruitment, a lot of emphasis, a lot of time spent on recruitment and trying to Get employees that are going to have retention, want to stay, are looking for a career. Uh, maybe it's a calling for them. Does the employee fit the profile? Can Not everybody wants more responsibility. Some people just want a very specific role. They want to know what they have to do and they just want to repeat that role. Others are seeking more responsibility and the ability to work in team environments. And you know what? When you have team goals and team accountability, you get peer pressure. Uh, you also get more stress that way, right? You feel that you have to uh, hold up for the team. Uh, so potential recruits are provided with a, a thorough briefing of how the organization is structured and what the cultural environment is like. There's a lot of time and effort then put into the recruitment process. Uh, people aren't just seen as, as assets. They're seen as people that are going to actually be dedicated to this company and that they're going to um, put their heart and souls into their work. And to ensure that they have the best training, training is done very, very effectively. And in many ways, it's the opposite of de-skilling. Employees are provided with broader understanding of what's going on. So it's not so quick to get them on the line and that's all that they do. It's to give them a good understanding of how the whole process works and then integrate them into their specific jobs while providing opportunities for rotations, while providing internal labor markets for able to being able to move up within the organization. All of those other factors are included in this type of organization. So we also want to ensure that they have access to information. Maybe they got some innovative idea. They got to have an idea of costs, structures, and things like that. So there's a lot more access to information, a lot more opportunities to communicate their ideas, a uh, lot of opportunities for job enlargement and enrichment, required authority and autonomy to be self-managing. Uh, so uh, greater scope for making valuable uh, contributions. So when I think about a high commitment organization, uh, one that I worked for, uh, did a lot of uh, consulting work for, 
uh, over the years uh, is uh, Ellis Dawn. Uh, it's a lar very, very large construction company, one of Canada's largest construction companies. And I really feel that they kind of uh, lived up to this sort of vision and uh, mission. They don't call it that. They call it values for them. Uh, but really, it, it gives you a really good sense of their purpose and who they are. And when we read that, although I wouldn't say it's exactly like a high commitment organization, there is a lot of points there, right? There is a lot of points there that pretty well aligns that. So for as far as being in the construction sector, I would say this is about as good as it gets um, for a high commitment organization and their core values. Um, so trust. We strive to give every person the freedom and responsibility to do their job, to make clients successful and to create opportunity. We presume they are honest and doing their very best. So there's trust. What that means is they don't need to micromanage you. They don't need to hold a stopwatch. If you're a few minutes late in the morning, they have trust that you're probably going to do your work either by staying late or you're just that much more efficient and you're going to get it done. Trust. Not all organizations work that way. Keep that in mind. And we also talked about Theory X and Theory Y. This aligns with Theory Y. It does not align with Theory X. Entrepreneurial enthusiasm. Really, it could be said to be intrapreneurial enthusiasm because an intrapreneur is somebody that works within the organization. So we want everybody to watch for and then seize new opportunities to think creatively and to attempt to innovate, whether or not that takes us away from our core business. Uh, Jeff Smith, who's the CEO, uh, he uh, had a number of uh, presentations he did uh, that I've seen him present, and I've been in a number of meetings uh, with him. Uh, and indeed, uh, I found it very interesting uh, from the point of view when I was uh, project manager for for technology at George Brown College when we built a new building. Uh, Jeff was the chairperson of our fundraising committee and I was on the fundraising committee at the time and I found that was very interesting that he was the chair on the fundraising committee for a building that Elliston wasn't going to build. They didn't have the contract to build it but yet he was helping us raise uh, money to build the building and he helped a lot. He did a lot of very interesting things that way so he's very 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 outward thinking forward thinking. Uh, and it was also interesting, didn't get that project, but guess what? It got the next two projects that we built, the waterfront campus and the student residence. So entrepreneurial enthusiasm, uh, he was at uh, doing a presentation and I remember uh, it was, a, he called it the cannonball story. And so Ellis Don's a construction company, but he was building a custom home and uh, he said that they were at a home show and he said he's not really, his background's actually not construction. He's a lawyer by craft. And he said that uh, his wife was sort of at this uh, radiant floor heating booth. And she was asking questions. And he said he was kind of looking around, not that interested. And she heard her ask um, the question, what if it leaks? And the salesperson said, it won't leak. And she said, well, what if it does leak? And he said, well, we'll fix it. And she said, how do I know you're going to be around? And he said, uh, our company has been around for 300 years. And Jeff said, now I, a light went off. Now I'm interested. How has this company been around 300 years? And so he started asking questions. Well, I know you didn't meet, make radiant floor heating 300 years ago. What did you make? Uh, it was cannonballs for the Spanish Armada. So they were in a totally different line of business. And they had evolved into this big conglomerate that made all these different kind of items. And he started thinking to himself, you know, our company, which barely survived the recessions in the early 90s, we need to be more forward looking and we need to be diversify ourselves. And how do you diversify yourself? You get into different areas. They got into a software area for productivity software for construction uh, companies. They got into um, owning parts of hospital uh, services on the hospitals that they build uh, to have something that would be a little bit more stable uh, when you have changes in economic conditions like a pandemic or something uh, or a big financial crisis. 
or a 911, all of those types of things that go on, right? And so part of that is trying to ensure that your employees are thinking in an entrepreneurial way, trying to think of new ways of doing things, trying to be innovative uh, on those prospects. So entrepreneurial enthusiasm is uh, one of their core values. The other one is complete openness. Well, we want to uh, show everything about our company with everyone who works uh, here, uh, the goals, the strategies, the business plans, and all the results, our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and fears, same as threats. Uh, so complete openness, that fits nicely with the transparency aspect of a high commitment organization. You know, you're not going to get entrepreneurial enthusiasm when things are hidden and you don't know what's going on. Uh, individual initiative. Uh, we are spread out and often closer to our clients, our problems and our opportunities than we are with each other. So we value those who can act quickly, intelligently, profitably in the interests of our clients and the company. This must in turn be combined with mutual accountability. Everyone at Ellis Don should be openly and equally accountable to everyone else who works here and who relies directly upon Ellis Don for their own and their family's success. We will work together to improve and we will each be accountable to each other. So you get the idea that you want to encourage entrepreneurship. You want to be able people to be able to make decisions. You know, they can't be all of a sudden waiting for head office to get make a decision because construction projects are very diverse. This company spread out all across Canada and has international locations as well. So you want to encourage decision making, but you want to ensure people are making the right decisions, not just going without thinking about it. So that's the mutual accountability aspect. And they're bringing in that big happy family aspect to say you're, you're also accountable to others and their families because everybody's reliant on these incomes. So trying to bring in that ownership aspect. These are very representative of a high commitment organization's core values. So just giving you a, a good sense of what that is. And I found by and large, they were pretty good with, with those items. And where they weren't, they were trying to improve in those particular areas. Uh, so um, kudos to them on uh, that aspect. Some companies will have that list there and it means nothing. And nobody reads it, nobody does it, nobody thinks about it. Uh, where it helps, I think, is that the CEO actually has a blog. You can even uh, go on their website and read up on the blog. And he always has some very interesting topics uh, that he discusses openly and listens to feedback and that sort of thing. It's a way to get out within the organization and to tell the organization's story so that it's really understood, which helps people to make the right decisions that helps build the strategy towards the overall goals. So an economist might look at the team-based production and see powerful peer pressure being used to combat free riding. You're working in teams, the team wants to get things done, there's peer pressure. They will also worry that there's too much uncontrollable risk, too much autonomy. That's the risk, right? You let people make decisions, they might make decisions that uh, could be very damaging. So you have to be careful about how much latitude you provide or be willing to accept the amount of damage that they can potentially do. Uh, sociologists or social psychologists will see the long-term employment relationships, the teams, the egalitarian culture, symbolism, the enriched and enlarged jobs, and think high levels of intrinsic motivation, right? We know what intrinsic is, so high levels of that. When you've got people that have more opportunities to make decisions, when you're encouraging entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship, uh, you're going to see a lot more engagement and a lot more motivation that's intrinsic in nature. Ideally, uh, motivational devices should be developed that work well on both sets of grounds, economic and social psychological, such as group-based rewards for reflecting the performance of smaller groups. And they have that. So uh, that's just giving you a, a good sense of a high commitment organization. Uh, I think about also when hiring employees of this quote by Warren Buffett. When hiring employees, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett's business, which is an 
huge in the sense of the number of employees, but which is huge in the sense of the companies that they own and the employees they have and uh, the impact it has on the overall economy. Uh, Warren Buffett being one of the wealthiest individuals in the world. Um, so he said he looks for three qualities, integrity, intelligence, and initiative. Uh, it was very interesting. He said integrity by far is the most important. The last thing you want to do is hire somebody uh, that doesn't have integrity but has a lot of intelligence and initiative, meaning they'll be doing things that they shouldn't be doing and it'll be very detrimental to the company. So having somebody with integrity would be preferable uh, to having uh, somebody without integrity. So a very important hiring product uh, to consider too when you're hiring somebody. So that gets us to total quality management. And I think it's, it's worth discussing here uh, because there's a very strong relationship to culture and to the way people do things uh, how we do anything is how we do everything, so, so to speak. And uh, I think we have to look a little bit historically again when we get into this area. Uh, Edwards Demings and J.M. Duran, they're credited with uh, developing the TQM systems uh, that we see out there today, the Toyota production system, Six Sigma, uh, lean construction. They all have their roots going back to the work of Deming and Duran. Uh, they were in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, uh, quality uh, production experts, and they worked in the U.S. And there wasn't as much opportunities there th that they felt with the ideas that they wanted to implement. So they had a lot of ideas that they wanted to implement. Interestingly enough, post-war, there was a lot of uh, rebuilding going on in both Europe and Japan after the war. And there was a lot of opportunity with J the Japanese uh, really uh, starting to turn their engines around to become uh, real big production giants of that time period. Uh, and they were just starting to grow with it, but they were having a lot of trouble with quality. Just to give you an idea when, and I might've mentioned this before, but when I was uh, growing up there, you know, if you bought a Japanese manufactured car, you were buying a piece of junk. Uh, you got it cheap, but it was a piece of junk. So, you know, in the 1970s, there was no Nissan. It was Datsun, uh, Toyota, Honda. If you bought any of those cars, they weren't very good. They rusted very quickly. They fell apart very quickly, but they were cheap. And the thing with them was they kept improving year by year, day by day, continuously improving. And the North American manufacturers, not really. They were kind of just going along on autopilot. They'd come up with different designs, but they weren't really improving. And it wasn't long before the Japanese cars were competing. Like the North American cars uh, manufacturers said, let them have the small cars and the, they're the low end of the market. We don't make a lot of money on them. We make money in the middle and high end sectors wasn't long before the Japanese were competing in the mid sector. And uh, the auto manufacturer, well, we've got trucks and we've got our uh, high end, you know, our Cadillacs and uh, those, those sectors, right? And then all of a sudden there was Lexus and there was uh, Infiniti and there was Acura. And they were making their cars better than the North American cars from a quality perspective. Sure, Ford had something called uh, for, uh, Ford is quality is job one, but having owned a Ford at that time, quality was like job 25, not job one. Uh, so they, they may have been spouting that, that quality was the number one thing, but they weren't delivering that quality was the number one thing. Uh, even uh, Ford bought Mazda, and there was a story out a number of years ago where they had Mazda make the transmissions for a certain model of car in the U.S., and they also made the transmission in, in the U.S., and they both made them to the same specifications, yet the car in the U.S. had no end of problems with those transmissions breaking down, but the ones coming from Japan didn't break down. And they wondered why when they built it to the same spec. Well, the Japanese, as soon as they saw the spec, they started tweaking it and adjusting it to make it better, lower the tolerances, and the transmission lasted a lot, lot longer. 
So uh, they were really, that was just the way they do it. It's not, it's a culture. It's a, it's a, a way of thinking. They have a term for it. It's called Kaizen, uh, which is continuous improvement. That's the way of thinking. So the work of Deming and Duran really sort of brought that in to the Japanese production system and the Toyota production system, probably the most renowned with that. So uh, eventually North American manufacturers did catch on and they, they have caught up in a, in a lot of ways. So I don't think that there is as big a difference as there was before because they had to, they had to adopt that philosophy or perish. And so they have been over, I'd say, the last 10 years. But it's hard to get rid of that reputation. Uh, it takes time to build that reputation and to change that reputation. So I don't think that uh, they fully have that reputation back yet about quality. Uh, but they're working on it. And I would say that they, you know, my example of Ford uh, going back so many years is not necessarily representative of today um, from that perspective. So Deming had this 14-point uh, plan, uh, and uh, the 14-point plan uh, is well published, so you can look it up online. You can see it in a lot of cases uh, to get his sort of basic principles. There's a lot to quality improvement, right? Uh, so this is his original 14-point plan, 14 plan uh, here. And it was even, it's interesting because Deming, I think it was Deming, uh, J.M. Duran came up with the whole aspect of focus on the cri critical uh, few, not the trivial many. That's his sort of big thing. Focus on the trivial few, not the, criti uh, the critical few, not the trivial many. And that really is the 2080 rule, which is Pareto's law, better known as the Pareto principle, named after the Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto, the 2080 rule uh, to focus in on. And that is really all about, you know, where am I going to get the biggest improvement the quickest? And that's where I'm going to focus my effort. Because if I've got X amount of machines that break down after we produce them, where is the most common cause of this breakdown? And that's fix that first. And that will get us 80% of our way on that result. And then the next item, what's left? Where is that the most uh, breakdowns occurring? That'll get us 80% of that result. And you just continue working that. So that's that Deming's, uh, that's that J.M. Duran uh, focus on the uh, critical few, not the trivial many. It's almost the way the critical path for you, those project managers out there uh, is that it allows you to focus in on the items that are going to uh, impact your project if they're delayed first, uh, as opposed to activities that have a lot of float and flexibility. <clears throat> so he has these 14 points, and some of them, by the way, they contravene other things that I've talked about in the course. So not everybody agrees with everything, like goal setting. Deming's got some issues with goal setting. Uh, create constancy of purpose towards improvement of the product and service so as to become competitive. Stay in business and provide jobs. So have big on purpose, big on mission, big on consistency. We've talked about consistency. We've talked about purpose, mission, that sort of thing, right? Uh, and towards that in improvement so that this isn't sort of a flavor of the month club you know, where quality is that this important for this week. I have a, he was a VP of uh, Madame Holmes at one time, and he's excellent uh, speaker, very good, thoughtful person. I remember him telling me that when he was uh, working in a plant uh, and when he was in high school or college, I think college, during the summertime, it, it was one of the automakers plants, and there was a bunch of engine blocks and they were put to the side. And he goes, well, why are they put to the side? Oh, they're outside the tolerance, the acceptable tolerances. And so they had a specification what the tolerances were. And I guess they were milled outside those tolerance levels. And the next day he came in, they were all gone. And he goes, oh, where did they go? Did they pick them up? And uh, the manager said, no, they're in the cars. We didn't get the new shipment, so they, we had to use them. So they went in the cars. 
And he thought, well, those cars are all going to have engine problems in a couple of years. Well, not our problem, right? That's going to be warranty and they'll deal with it. Or it won't be warranty and people just have these cars that have lousy engines in it. And he, he was very disheartened with that whole attitude that the company had, that the manufacturer had. And while they were espousing quality, they weren't delivering quality. So there was no constancy of purpose towards improvement. After that, they could say whatever they wanted, but he's not buying into it because they're not acting on it. So you have to be careful as a manager and as a business, how you act and behave, your employees are going to pick up on that. So if a decision is going to be made to uh, dispense with quality over profit and not worry about it, then that tells that employee profit's the line. So if I got to make a decision... We're going with the short versus the long game. We're not going with the long game. We're going with the short game. It makes a difference then how people act and behave. Adopt the new philosophy. We are in a new economic age. We no longer need to live uh, with commonly accepted levels of delay, mistakes, defective material, defective workmanship. So this was in the 60s, 70s, 80s. I think when he came up with the points was some probably somewhere in the 70s. Uh, he was actually retired, and there was it was interesting because he really did he really didn't get much uh, fame while he was working in Japan, but not until the Japanese started to smoke basically the North American manufacturers and what's happening? How did they get all these processes? And then people went to Japan to try to do some uh, digging, and I think it was uh, the Toyota. Uh, corporation said, well, we got a lot of the ideas from your own Deming. Well, how is it you guys don't know about Deming and Durant? Like, you know, it was kind of like, how is it they're, they're American? How do you not know about them? And uh, so then they, they were, at least I think it was Deming that was pulled out of retirement and started helping, got a second career, if you will. I think he lived well into his 90s. So I think he had a long and fruitful career uh, helping North American companies uh, develop. I think GE was one of them. So cease dependence on mass inspection, uh, inspection require instead statistical evidence that quality is built in. So forget about all of the inspections, make people accountable that are doing the work, but even more so make it that it's difficult for them to make a mistake huge on systems. That means huge on systems and processes to root out and eliminate the ability to make mistakes. So if you can root out the ability to make mistakes, then you don't have that human failability in the process. Of course, we can't completely do that, but that is the philosophy that continuous improvement brings into the process. So instead of hiring a thousand inspectors, let's go back and look at the root cause of the problem and let's see if we can change the process so that this problem doesn't occur anymore. Improve the quality of incoming materials and the practice of awarding business on the basis of price alone. Instead, depend on meaningful measures of quality along with price. Boy, could the construction industry learn a lot from this one. Uh, we still tend to award to the lowest price. We try to pre-qualify the contractors, but uh, they're, they're, that causes a lot of issues in the construction industry. So uh, he was not a fan of lowest price because lowest price didn't mean highest quality. And instead, depend on meaningful measures of quality along with price. So companies having to prove their quality. And that... That also means, uh, from his system's approach, is you help your suppliers to improve their quality because if their product is going in your, in your product, uh, then it represents your product. So working with them to ensure that they are meeting the expected standards that are required for your product and helping them with your systems. Finding the problems constantly improve the system of production and service. There should be continual reduction of waste and continual improvement of quality in every activity so as to yield a continual rise in productivity and a decrease in costs. It is a way of thinking. When you walk management by wandering around, when you walk a, a project, when you walk a manufacturing site, when you walk a mine, 
You're looking and you're thinking and you're observing and you're asking questions and they're revolving around improving the product, improving the quality and eliminating waste. This all ties into lean manufacturing, reducing waste. And waste is a problem when we get into uh, development of anything. So lean thinking is looking to constantly improve the system of production and service. It's a way of thinking and a lot of people don't think that way, but it really is kind of, you know, it's really kind of exciting. I find it's very exciting when I walk around and I'm trying to figure out ways or see waste and trying to figure out ways. Well, how could we prevent that the next time? How could we stop that happening again the next time? And what process could we put into place the next time to prevent that. I've even been working on, because this is an online course, uh, I've been finding that I do a lot of things and then I make these little mistakes and it kind of annoys me. So I've been slowly developing a checklist on this. Maybe I can pull it up here while I'm talking to you. Uh, we'll see how good I am with this. Uh, yeah, there it is. So I've been doing this little video shoot checklist. Checklist is something that I use all the time. And probably in one of the classes, I'll talk about uh, checklists when we're doing the live uh, session. Um, just go back here. So I have sort of a, a list of checklists, right? I think I got 22 checklists that I use for different different purposes whenever I do different things. And that saves me a lot of trouble. It saves me uh, making mistakes. It keeps me on point. It keeps me on time. It stops me from forgetting things. Uh, checklists are, I think of the checklist manifesto. I think I mentioned it in an earlier lecture, Atal Gawande, and how they've used that to reduce deaths in surgery by 50% from errors that surgeons would typically make. So Deming's all about developing systems, much more sophisticated systems than something as simple as that, but nevertheless, nevertheless, that's a system uh, that improves your ability to uh, be more productive, have less rework in the process. Institute Modern Methods of Training and Education for All. Modern methods of on-the-job training use control charts to determine whether a worker has been properly trained and is able to perform the job correctly. Uh, statistical methods must be used to discover when training is complete. So, and I run into this all the time where I do a lot of corporate training. I really encourage the clients that I work with to let's have some sort of methodology that we can measure how well this material stuck. Because you, you have the ability to do a course, but then how much do you remember after you do the course? And so having the ability to test people uh, several months out or to measure improvements if it's something that's very measurable and quantifiable uh, and get feedback on that because that feedback can allow you to adjust the training program so it keeps continuously improving as well. So continuous improvement in uh, work, it's not just in the work, it's also in the training and every aspect of the business. It's a way of thinking. Institute modern methods of supervision. The emphasis uh, of production supervisors must be to help people to do a better job. Improvement of quality will automatically improve productivity. Management must prepare to take immediate action on response from supervisors concerning problems such as inherited defects, lack of maintenance of machines, poor tools, or fuzzy operational definitions. If you have a management team that could care less about these things and is not responsive, then pretty soon the next level of management doesn't feel that motivated and certainly the front line doesn't get that motivated. And so the errors and reworks and quality issues and production issues tend to multiply. And of course, you can't be fearful to make a mistake or to report something if that's the case, then you're not going to know about it. So fear is a barrier to improvement. Um, so drive out fear by encouraging effective two-way communication uh, that will enable everybody to be part of change. 
and to belong to it, right? So, you know, we talked about Taylorism and soldiering. People didn't want to be working faster because if they're working more efficiently, they feel they're going to lose their jobs. As a company, you've got to sort of instill that this is going to lead us to be more profitable. If we're more profitable, then we're going to need more people. And there's no better job security than having when a company is growing than when it's shrinking. So you have to work on uh, the fear aspect. And if somebody makes a mistake, if they're more willing to hide the mistake than to report the mistake, then the mistake doesn't get fixed. It may be found, but it doesn't get fixed because you can't really figure out where the mistake was caused because people have covered up the cause. So uh, he had a lot of good ideas in the, those areas. Break down barriers between departments and staff areas. So I've mentioned the silos. You've got to get cross-pollination going between the silos. Any company that's got rock-solid silos with managers competing against each other in different areas, you, you know, you're spinning wheels for nothing. And so you need to have that collaboration. So build cross uh, cross-pollinated teams that get to work with each other and then they get to know each other the relationships are built and then it's much easier to um, push about drastic changes or even simple changes that the organization needs to go with particularly with continuous improvement he was not a fan of slogans I'm not a fan of slogans either if they're being used and they're not being followed BP we're the green oil company not a good idea. Ford, quality is job one. At that time, not a good idea, right? If you're uh, espousing that, but you're not living it and breathing it, it's a mistake. So that was Deming's idea that uh, eliminate the use of posters, exhortations. He really wanted to lie on statistics and improvements and um, that sort of thing, right? Eliminate work standards that prescribe numerical quotes for the workforce and numerical goals for people in management. Substitute aids and helpful leadership. Use statistical methods for continual improvement of quality and productivity. Uh, really understanding uh, where uh, the 2080 aspect is, where our opportunities are, how much this will mean in improvement, monitoring it statistically where possible. That is following Deming's points. Uh, numbers speak louder than words as you get from the slogans compared to um, the data orientation. And this being a group of uh, engineering students, I think you can relate very strongly with that. Remove the barriers that rob hourly workers and people in management of the right to pride of workmanship. This implies abolition of the annual merit rating uh, appraisal of performance and of management by objective. Again, the responsibility of managers, supervisors, foremen must be changed from sheer numbers to quality. He was very concerned about goals because people would work towards those goals and particularly if the goals were around profit. We know about those of you in project management, the relationship between time, cost and quality and if you're focusing on uh, cost or you're focusing on time, the engine block example would be it. Uh, quality goes out the window. And usually he felt those types of goals push people to ne negate quality because number one and number two was time and cost. Because time, in essence, went back to profit. So that's why he was not a huge fan of goals. And then he felt tied to that extrinsic rewards based on production is going to push people to perform more to push out more widgets but at a lower quality level so that was again behind those points there's a lot of nuances and space between the spaces on some of these points so you have to sort of take a realistic view of it to fully bring it uh, to bear but i think you're starting to see you know, the time, cost, quality, and how then that affects the people actually doing the work, and then managers, how that affects your interaction and what you say, what you do, what you exemplify, how that is interpreted by your employees. Institute a vigorous program of education and encourage self-improvement for everyone. 
What an organization is needs is not just good people, it needs people that are improving with education. Advances in competitive composition will have their roots in knowledge. He was way ahead of his time. The whole aspect of continuous learning, uh, lifelong learning, he was way ahead of it. So he felt that organizations that train their people uh, as changes are taking place, they're training their people, they're going to have much more agile people that are able to adapt, much more resilient people. Uh, he was ahead of the curve on that. Top management's permanent commitment to ever-improving ever quality and productivity must be clearly defined and a management structure created that will continuously take action to follow the preceding 13 points. You have to have the full commitment of senior management. If you don't have the full commitment, you don't have consistency, then you won't have expectancy. So all of those things that we talked about in previous classes, again, they build into this in a lot of ways. And the one thing that does contravene is the management by objectives. But I, I, I firmly believe that you can manage that management by objectives uh, still by very closely uh, ensuring that quality is a big concern if that's what you're looking at. And when you tie the aspects of quality with lean, trying to have less waste, it ends up leading to more profitability. It's playing the long game as opposed to the short game. The short game is we're thinking about the quarterly profits. We're thinking about the yearly profits. Uh, the long game is we're building a brand and a reputation that people, when we have them, if it's the car industry, they're going to want to buy our cars over and over again. If it's the construction industry, we want that contractor to do this project. We want them to do the next project. Why do I want to risk switching contractors when I know this contract contractor and they deliver what they say? And that includes quality. So that's Deming's uh, 14 points on uh, the quality control. Uh, and some of the things I think about with uh, quality control, continuous improvement, schedules, why have airlines improved to become the safest form of travel? Uh, you might want to ponder that one. Usually I have some students from the aviation side, so that usually makes a pretty good uh, discussion. Uh, why have airlines improved to become the safest form of travel? And we can even discuss the Boeing 737 when we meet uh, synchronously and some of the issues there. Linear thinking has to change in order for improvements to be made. Why? So linear thinking has to change in order for improvements to be made. I want you to think about that and what I might mean by that. A leads to B, B leads to C, C leads to D. Industries that have not improved the same way when it comes to human error. Medicine, legal systems, why? How does your industry fit into this? Uh, medicine really has had a number of problems, as I mentioned. And we talked about the continuous uh, improvement. We talked about the growth versus the fixed mindset. What is the difference between a growth and fixed mindset? And I mentioned Carol Dweck, right? A uh, fixed mindset person is set in their ways, is not open to change. They also feel they cannot change or learn in certain areas. A growth mindset person is willing to try new things knows that healthy criticism will help them learn while expanding their knowledge and skills, help them to get better when it's delivered in the right way. We'll talk about that in the other part of the course. People and businesses can fall into the fixed mindset trap. This is what we do. This is all we know how to do. We can't do that. We've never done that. We did that before and it failed. That's a fixed mindset. And that's something that you, you, know, you want to limit. Cognitive dissonance is another thing to recognize is that sometimes people get so rooted in a specific idea when they're confronted with new information, they will find everything in the world to disclaim it or to support their original idea. This happens with uh, judges. It happens with lawyers, prosecutors. Uh, it happens sometimes in surgery with surgeons. Uh, really have to be careful of this cognitive dissonance. Excellent book written called Black Box uh, Thinking uh, and how sometimes you're limited in, in what your thinking uh, actually is. 
Uh, and sometimes you form this cognitive dissonance where you will not accept uh, another viewpoint. And it's not that you're lying. It's that you truly believe it. You kind of build yourself into this box and you start to believe that the world is flat and nobody can tell you it's round no matter what. So it's flat. Like it doesn't matter. You can come up with uh, some viewpoint that supports that decision. And so that becomes difficult in the real world. It's why sometimes somebody that was convicted is proven to be completely innocent with DNA and the prosecutor is still saying they did it, right? Uh, so it's kind of like in the U.S. why you can't try somebody a second time because you have a prosecutor that's just constantly after that person uh, because they have this cognitive dissonance that they can't see it a different way. So um, think about these questions and think about these questions and we'll have a really good uh, discussion on uh, TQM and Deming's points and a high commitment organization. Maybe some of you have worked for high commitment organizations. Maybe some of you have worked for the opposite of a high commitment organization. And we can compare and contrast when we talk uh, in the class uh, soon enough. Okay, so I'm Tom Stevenson signing off. I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye for now.